for the use of data for that specific purpose. So in that sense, when we agree to the use of data, there is a market price at which I get paid anytime my data is used. Data in the past has been compared to oil. Unlike oil, the same data can be used for multiple times. So we keep getting residual value. And anytime the data is used, I, as the owner of data, can get paid and I pay taxes. And the user of data, as they use it, they can pay taxes as well. And we can create a cross-border scheme so that if countries agree to share data on common purposes such as agriculture and health, we can enable cross-border data flows and cross-border payments. So we can address reimagining consent piece, data sharing across borders. It's not an all or nothing approach. It is for common purposes and the distribution of data dividend in an inclusive and transparent manner. We had our advisory board meeting for the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network earlier this week. And Amitabh, uh, you were uh, on that, uh, in that meeting as well. And one of the CEOs of a Japanese insurance company said, I have a lot of data, how do I assign value to it? The other question is, if people, and Vala, this is an area of uh, your expertise, uh, and um, you may be going deeper into it, but one of the questions is, what happens if people are not able to manage their own data? They may not have access to technology, they may not have all the information. So for that, we're seeing the creation of what we call data trusts, legal entities, much like a collective for a farm, for farmers, to represent multiple people. So if we can achieve this dream, we can ensure that the data is used in an inclusive and equitable manner, and the data dividend is distributed transparently to hundreds of millions of people, and the corporations can unlock this asset they're sitting on. There has been a study by a leading consulting firm saying that this type of approach could add two, three trillion dollars to the global economy. I think that's an underestimation. And this is why we need the infrastructure, the communication infrastructure to collect and distribute data. We need to have intelligent sensors and ethical sensors like uh, Internet of Things. We need a forward looking and equitable and transparent data policies in place, not only just vectoring on privacy. And we need to have AI governance protocols in place to make sure that AI is beneficial for all, it's transparent and inclusive. Once again, I'd like to congratulate uh, India for uh, this hugely successful event, raising the issue, and we we'll look forward to a close collaboration with all of the Indian community, multi-stakeholder community, as we chart the path for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murat. And uh, the ideas that you just mentioned about data sharing and data consent frameworks and how do we make data rich and data intelligent uh, ecosystems resonates very well with several of the sessions that we had in the conference. And in fact, this evening only we had a session on data consent mechanism where Krish Gopalakrishnan who authored the non-personal data committee report for government of India, he was there. And many of the things that you mentioned resonates very well there. So we are thankful to you and WEF for supporting the summit in a great manner. WEF speakers were there almost in many sessions. And we are also thankful to international partners like the World Bank, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, the UN Women, the United Nations Capital Development Fund, European Commission, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UNICEF, UNESCAP, who has been taking active part in this, call, in this uh, summit. We also had active participations from academic institutions from across the world, from our IITs, triple IITs, the Indian Institute of Science, the NITs, then the MIT, Stanford. We have professors from Stanford, MIT, Oregon State University, Purdue University, University of Oxford, University of Chicago Law School, and the uh, Bar Ilan University, Israel, and the Carnegie Mellon School of Engineering, who addressed several sessions in that. One key aspect of this whole summit has been the partnership with industry, in which we had industry partners from NASCOM, CII, FICI, IBM, Vadwani AI was a key part of it. And uh, to carry forward the partnership with the industry, we are one of the doyans of the IT industry of India and the world. Mr. N. Chandra Shekhar, uh, N. Chandra, chairman of the Tata Sons, present here today to address us in this uh, closing ceremony. N. Chandra is the chairman of the board of Tata Sons, which is the holding company of the Tata Group of Companies with annual revenues of $110 billion and market cap of more than $165 billion. He is on the International Advisory Bo Council of Singapore's Economic Development Board. He is also the chairman of IM Lucknow, as well as president of court at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is also the co-chair of India-US CEO Forum, 
one of the most distinguished tech leaders that we have in the country and is also the author of the famous book digital nation so we welcome you sir for this uh, for your address thank you abhishek um, we are at a pivotal moment over the last two decades there are two important developments and both of them have converged the first one as all of you know we have generated data at an unprecedented scale second ai machine learning the cloud and the internet of things and the combination of these technologies have attained significant maturity to such a degree that today we have the ability to process this scale of data at real time these developments have already changed and are significantly changing the way our children study how we diagnose a disease how we can provide a preventive care how businesses large and small operate and also how we work ai presents an unprecedented opportunity and at the same time poses some deep and fundamental questions for the future because ai is not merely a technology but fundamentally it is a different way of doing business and gives a set of toolkits which can not only enable us to plan our companies and businesses future and if i may say so can help us plan our country's future and direction how we want to shape our country's future we are in the midst of a huge transformation which i call as going from information society to an insights driven insights driven society and also from a process driven business and society to prediction driven business and society these are happening as we speak and we don't have time to recognize it because it's moving at such a pace so it is critical to understand this as in india and in the world we move towards defining the next decade india can be a leader in the digital economy of tomorrow if only we recognize and make the most use of our single most valuable resource or endowment that is talent for the coming decade to be india's decade to my mind there are two challenges on the one hand solving the access challenge to make every service like healthcare like education available to every citizen irrespective of the place where they live on the other hand we find meaningful productive futuristic jobs for the vast population of young indians who are today and who are coming into the workforce and i think the bridge between both these problems rather the solution to solve these two challenges and create humongous opportunity is the bridge using ai ai is going to be the fundamental way we can solve this problem and what that requires is that ai and ai based solutions tools and technologies are not put to use for the elite instead they are given to the common man and we are able to empower the common man the no skilled man and the low skilled human beings citizens men and women this means our vision should not be only centered around software professionals and data scientists and other white collar workers but our vision should 
include farmers, truck drivers, shopkeepers, and teachers, and everyone else. As our Honorable Prime Minister mentioned during the inaugural session in the conference, I read a quote, teamwork of AI with humans can do wonders for our planet. And you can't say it any better. AI covers tremendous ground from scientific research to talent development to skills, ethics, inclusion. There are very many different directions. Standards are needed. We need to address uh, data related issues and we need to create the digital infrastructure. But in order to address all of this in a holistic manner, I propose three fundamental investments. First is investing in AI development. By that, what I mean is not only deep tech capabilities, but design capabilities, and also India becomes an R&D hub, research and development hub of AI for India and for the world. And whatever investments are required for that, and we should accelerate that. Second, we need to reimagine all the AI applications. What it again means is that how do you reimagine the job to be done? Whether it is healthcare workers, whether it is teachers, whether it is, I come, I come back to truck drivers and judiciary, in every single dimension, what is the job to be done? And what is the process now and in a predictive world, in an AI-driven world, how it can be reimagined? And that requires an ecosystem. That requires a lot of innovation. That requires the startup community. That requires an inclusive AI where everybody is working together. The third one is a very important one. I think uh, uh, Murat also touched it a little bit. Right now, the global digital economy is in fact headed for a splintered future that will limit the scalability and potential of the entire platform economics. That is because of the issues related to data governance. Solving for data governance, specifically, what should be the global standards for data residency, localization, privacy, security, is a very important step for our long-term success. And I think developing the policy frameworks will accelerate the adoption of AI and AI-based solutions in a significant way, as world's well largest democracy and as a place where data is just getting created at such high volume and where there are many problems all of which can be solved by AI, I really think India should seize the opportunity to lead this globally. And a word for Meiti, I think Meiti has done an outstanding job in terms of raising the awareness of AI and trying to get the global ecosystems together. So I want to congratulate Meiti, not only through this conference, but many other efforts, but we should not lose the momentum we should quickly move into execution, whether it is in research and development, whether it is in all the other areas that I mentioned. And also I want to compliment the India's decision to focus on responsible and inclusive AI. And it is a very commendable effort because unless or otherwise we take these problems head on and lead the whole policy formulation we will not be able to accelerate innovation and collaboration. And none of this can be achieved by any one single institution, a single body, a single government, or a single business. Collaboration is going to be key. I think uh, in conclusion, I'll say India clearly has the potential to become a capital of the world. The reason I say that is just not because I'm here in India and I, you know, I love India and so on. 
I think we have talent and all of you know we have abundant talent. But more importantly, I think we have unique challenges. And we are in a sweet spot where we have the talent and we have the kind of complex complexity that only AI can solve. And if you are able to do that, it's not only about uh, bragging or anything, it is about creating a future which can travel to other parts of the world, to developing nations and even um, even developed nations because healthcare is a problem and the problem in India is access, the problem in the US is cost. So uh, at the end of the day, access is not there. People don't get what they should get and uh, we should be able to do many things uh, proactively. But leading in this space and achieving success in AI will help India to solve many of the other problems. For example, it can help solve our sustainability problem. It can help solve, uh, solve our healthcare problem, solve our problem in terms of providing all the children, the 21st century education. 21st century education is about creative skills, collaborative skills. It is about design skills. Um, it is about computing skills. It is not about only about counting and, uh, um, and, 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 and reading. Reading, writing, and counting um, were necessary and it's still necessary, but teaching the 21st century skills is not uh, any more complicated. And so if we take the right steps and we have a tremendous opportunity for doing good for India and also for the world. Thank you all for listening and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, thank you, sir. And uh... I'm sure with your uh, three-point uh, mantra for investment, investing in AI development, reimagining AI applications, and contributing to the global digital data governance framework with regard to all the issues that data will go a long way in bringing, building an AI roadmap for India and the world, which will help us realize the potential that we have for responsible AI and provide the leadership to the world. Now, I have the proud privilege of welcoming our, our keynote speaker for the evening, Mr. Wala Afshar. He's the chief data evangelist of Salesforce. He's one of the most followed influencers of data science on Twitter and my source of daily factoid on Twitter. He contributes weekly technology, business, and leadership articles to Huffington Post, INC Magazine, and other publications. He hosts a weekly video show called Disrupt TV, inviting Fortune 1000 business executives, startup founders, venture capitalists, and tech and media personalities covering business, technology, and leadership roles. Mr. Afsar has interviewed over 350 business leaders since 2013. His presentations, uh, slide share presentations have more than 1.5 million views. One can read his book about social business excellence. One of the top tech leaders and thinkers in today's world, Radio Data Science. Welcome, Mr. Wala, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much uh, for your kind words and congratulations to the Raise 2020 community. It's a privilege and an honor for me to be part of the closing session. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce. I'm going to talk to you about electricity and flow. And some of you may think I am a Vincent van Gogh uh, fan or expert. I'm not. The reason I chose this background image is because this digital image was produced by an AI algorithm using a generative adversarial network, which is a class of machine learning. Uh, we have this beautiful uh, image in the background, which is a reminder to me that even the most creative work, uh, an artist, uh, can have impact in terms of AI. My presentation to you today is about the power of movement and how when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're really talking about technology that can help accelerate movement and growth as individuals, as organization, and as companies. For centuries, it's important to know that we've had a silo mentality when it comes to business. Our firms are organized to capture resources, protect those resources, and extract as much value as we can from those resources. This silo mindset it can be seen across all industries. Uh, from beginning of time, really, uh, consumption, protection, and extraction of value is what governed our thinking in terms of value as individuals, as organizations, as companies.
But as, but as it was mentioned earlier in the fourth industrial revolution in the world of hyper-connected digital economy, we can no longer grow to our full potential with a silo mindset. And as last year Nobel Prize winner reminded us, really accessible solutions is how we make progress. It's about democratization, it's about access. Today, half of the human population in the world does not have internet access, just to reflect on the importance of accessibility and affordability. In fact, the stunning flow of technological advancements, and, and I mentioned in the last 27 years, because I believe the, the democratization and access to the web, which uh, was made available in 1993, really unleashed the power uh, and the importance of shifting away from a silo mindset. In fact, when you look at the technological revolution uh, you know, of the last 70 years, and, you, and, you, and uh, uh, in terms of adoption over time, you almost see a perpendicular line in terms of the accelerated adoption. And I would argue that you know, this started with perhaps the most important invention of the 20th century, which was the transistor, which was introduced in 1947, Coincidentally, the same year India celebrated its independence. And with the, with the invention of the transistor, we see mainframe, web, uh, big data and analytics, and of course, uh, artificial intelligence and its adoption because of the low cost of processing and storage, which has created this incredible phenomenon. What that means is that we're in the middle of an intelligence revolution. Every application we have that governs and guides our information technology sector and all other industries needs to be guided, needs to be predictive, needs to be proactive, and it needs to be prescriptive. We need to be able to tell our stakeholders, our employees, our customers, our business partners, our communities, what they can do today in order to achieve the goals that they have of tomorrow, prescriptive use of analytics. So what that means is we have now a digital consumer at the middle of how we interact with the world. Certainly a lesson in 2020 due to the pandemic is that every company, every industry must be digital. We had a major blind spot prior to the pandemic. And in my opinion, that blind spot was the power of decentralization. Overnight at the beginning of this year due to the pandemic, we shifted to a decentralized digital only construct in the way we engage with our stakeholders. And that was an incredibly important lesson for business in terms of what the future will look like. Now, in the US, we have seen 10 years of increased adoption in e-commerce, for example, just in the last three months. And this is not just a US phenomena, this is a global phenomena, including India. In fact, since the pandemic, there is a shock to brand loyalty. Consumers, customers are looking for safety and accessibility. In fact, 91% of consumers in India switched the, to a new brand since COVID-19 pandemic. That is the largest switch in terms of brands of any country in the world. Indian consumers, are, they have choices, they have voices, they have power to choose companies that can delight them during times of uncertainty. Which means, again, that silo mentality must be challenged in terms of how we connect with our consumers. When I talk about a digital economy and the power of AI, I just wanted to give you a view of what one minute of internet looks like. We're sending almost 200 million emails every 60 seconds. We're delivering thousands of packages, millions of hours of new video. This is what the hyper-connected knowledge sharing economy looks like. And this is why power of AI comes into play because we are producing more data than ever before. In my company, this is what 24 hours looks like at Salesforce. At Salesforce, we're producing nearly 14 billion AI predictions per day. We're creating almost 12 million service cases. So whether it's business to consumer or business to business, one company, Salesforce, has this amount of volume every 24 hours to give you a sense of the power of data in terms of value creation and ability to connect with your stakeholders in a meaningful way. Now, there was a reference about data and oil. When you look at the last century, in fact, the last 10 years, by market capitalization, the most valuable companies in the world historically were oil companies. In fact, 10 years ago, there was only one tech company that was in the top 10 most valuable but market cap. If you look at today, seven of the 10 most valuable companies 
are information technology companies. And they are in the business of flowing resources and values and goods and services to their consumers. Think about Alibaba last year, sold $38 billion of goods in one day. That's a company that's designed for movement, whether it's Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. In my opinion, when we look at 2030 and the list of the most valuable companies, I believe the top 30 will be technology companies. So every company is a digital technology company, regardless of what sector you're in, in this new normal. Now, some people talk about data as oil. I believe data is like water. It is essential for life and it needs to be clean and accessible to everyone. Data is key to AI economy. And this is why India is poised to be a superpower when it comes to AI. You have 600 million unique users connected to the internet. You have an opportunity in the next five to six years to be a $6 trillion consumer spend power in India. Every three seconds, a new person in India connects to the internet for the first time. What that means is that 600 million today will be over a billion unique connected users to the internet in perhaps just the next five years. This also means India is poised to be the second largest GDP in the world, only behind China and ahead of the US. So the power of India and the fact that 80% of the population will be under the age 44, you are the most advanced connected society in the world. One sixth of humanity is in India. So data will fuel the AI hub vision that you have in terms of expanding to, uh, to the world. Now, in my opinion, when I think about silos, what the new norm will look like and the opportunity for companies to grow and individuals, it's thinking about flows, it's design thinking principles about flow. So it's not consumption of resources and domain expertise, but actually capture and flow through to your stakeholders. So how do we reach our full potential? That's the question we need to be asking. We know it's about movement. That's the power of AI in my opinion. So we need to remind ourselves of, of the most autonomous, most automated intelligence system, and that's the human body. Think about the circulatory system we have. It's the pulmonary, which is our lungs that brings oxygen. It's our cardiovascular, which is our heart that disseminates nutrients to our system. And it's our systemic, there are arteries and veins. The pulmonary, cardiovascular and systemic make the circulatory system. When I think of the heart and the lung as pumps, that's what departments are in businesses, sales, services, marketing, IT, commerce. You capture resources, we analyze resources, and we disseminate what we think is goodness for our business. We have filters to make sure good nutrients gets through our system. AI is the power of filtering and making sure proper insights is being delivered to our businesses. So the future business needs to be designed like a living organism. And there was references to an enriching environment like startup communities, corporate venture capital, our partners and ecosystem. We need water, food and drink to survive. Businesses need to have partnership and enriching environments for new sources of talent, new sources of income, new sources of business model innovation, new partnerships. We cannot do this alone. And that's why silo mentality will not help our companies compete in a post-digital economy. A reminder that all living systems are flow-based. All living systems circulate resources through their organisms and their environments. So in fact, when we talk about health of individuals, we talk about relationship uh, based on flows of value, learning based on flows of knowledge, mental well-being in terms of psychological flow. We talk about a healthy individual based on flow principles. And we also talk about flow when in, in terms of healthy business. We have internal flows, how we manage our culture, our talent, our process and innovation. We have external flows in terms of customer value, partner value, ecosystem value. These flows are bi-directional in nature. The way we manage our Salesforce business in India is focused on these internal values and external values based on flow. So an example of removing friction and flow, I would use Amazon. Amazon in the next couple of years will have 3000 stores where you walk in the store, you pick up the merchandise and you walk out minimum friction, optimal user experience, 
Optimal flow is minimum friction. So this is an example of a company with, again, a trillion dollar market value that's been in the business of reducing friction and optimizing flow. I'm gonna, in my opinion, take you to 10 years in the future. I believe that the closest man-made invention to a living organism is an autonomous vehicle. When you look at the sensing, perception, this decision, and actuation logic that make up an electric vehicle, an autonomous electric vehicle, and I'm going to use Tesla as an example, because I believe Tesla is going to be the first trillion dollar market cap audio man auto manufacturer, because Tesla is not a car company. They're a data company. They're a software company. They're an ecosystem company. And the building blocks of a Tesla autonomous vehicle, I believe, is the future of business. I believe the flow, the flow principles of connection, distribution, autonomy, mobility, and the autonomous design and the combination of technologies that create this autonomous design are based on flow principles. The future of enterprise is going to be an autonomous enterprise where there's a cognitive download from humans to machines and you are co-creating value in this human and machine led enterprise. This is the autonomous enterprise. So when I think of principles of flows, and this is based on two years of research uh, following the fastest growing companies that are clients of Salesforce, I believe there are seven principles that create this optimal positioning for growth and movement. It's connections. When I think of artificial intelligence, the ability to analyze structured and unstructured data will help companies identify unique new connections, but also bolster existing connections because you are able to build your anticipatory muscle and create those prescriptive use of analytics where you're able to proactively delight your stakeholders creating the longer lasting connections. I think about distribution. Distribution, AI will help us orchestrate multi-cloud application and on-premise legacy solutions, creating an environment where, you know, any growing company, for example, knows customer service is not a department. Customer service is everybody in the business, sales, service, commerce, IT, working together to anticipate the needs of your customers. So distribution becomes key. Integration is important. Again, looking at the multiple applications, an average enterprise has 900 applications. That's part of their business, an average large enterprise. Imagine the discontinuity and the data silos that exist if you're not integrating on average 900 business applications in order to create minimum friction and optimal flow. Autonomy, autonomy is about, it's about access, it's about intelligence. When I think about Soul, the self-organized learning environment developed by Sugata Mitra, inventor of the hole in the ball learning experiment, this is an example for me of fantastic autonomy that was led by thought leadership in India. I think about mobility. We have to establish trust. The only way companies can establish trust is speed to value. In order to create speed to value and be relevant, you have to create mobility. One lesson in 2020 post pandemic is you should be able to work from anywhere. As long as you don't have physical dependence with your job, you should be able to use smart devices. And as long as you have internet, you should be able to work from anywhere. This is the power of mobility that's unleashed by AI. Continuity, this is a hyper speed uh, computer looking at the movement of a master martial artist and it's about agile and low friction. But the same high-speed camera captures the micro movements of a master martial artist, artist. Industries need to know that the power of AI is to get that augmented intelligence, not auto uh, automated, but augmented intelligence, so that every movement you make includes excellence in execution. Your execution velocity, speed and direction at micro levels in services, in sales, in marketing, in IT, in commerce, must all have this augmented intelligence in order for you to make well-informed decisions in order to meet the needs of your stakeholders. Holistic success. This is, I think, one of the most important differences between silo mentality and flow principles. When I think of the Makabari tea estates in Darjeeling, uh, you know, uh, world's first tea factory uh, established in the 1800s, the farmers are artists. Uh, the, 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 the workers own piece uh, of the estate. They have free primary education. They have community libraries and computer centers. You know, this is an example of holistic success. So as companies think about using AI, they need to be thinking about how do you provide value to all your stakeholders in an inclusive manner? This is a very important element of flow-based design thinking principles. So as you look at silo-based, 
versus flow-based. It's technologies like AI and machine learning that enable you to shift from consumption, protection, and extraction of maximum value to really a new mindset that allows you to connect to your stakeholders in a meaningful way. So AI accelerates flow. My, based on my research and the companies that I have the privilege of working with, the ones that have the fastest growth trajectories recognize the combination of emerging technologies is what allowing them to move fast and adopt. Now, the founder of my company believes that, you know, it's your culture, it's your guiding principles, uh, but also the importance of AI. We believe AI is a human right. We believe that if you don't have access to AI, you're not going to be as healthy, you're not going to be as wealthy, and you're not going to be able to compete. So in no other technology, I mean, we, some still debate whether internet should be a human right, which I believe obviously the answer is yes, but AI is so impactful that it should be a human right. Some of the biggest and most influential executives in the world believe it's the most important uh, technology that they've ever worked on. So there's no question or no debate in terms of the potential of AI in terms of shaping our future. When you look at the global investments in AI, this is as of October 2020, there's in 13 different categories in AI, there's been over $104 billion in investment in 70 countries. What's interesting in these 13 categories and the global AI investments in AI is that when you look at the maturity of these technologies and the investments, uh, there are no specific categories that are mature. Other than you know, speech translation, most of these categories in AI are at the beginning stages. It's really the last five, six years where we've seen incredible movements in terms of investments in AI. But this is a sign that you know, investments in startups is a sign in terms of the trajectory and the impact of technology. So I was very pleased to see the startup competition in RAISE 2020. We need to invest in growing the startup ecosystem. And my prediction that 104 billion, when we are here this time next year, we're probably gonna to touch 200 billion in terms of, this number will double in my opinion in the next 12 months. So investments in AI's uh, companies is, is critical to our success. Now the honorary prime minister, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the opening uh, ceremonies talked about building the bridge between artificial intelligence, human intelligence. What's important when we talk about human intelligence, it's not just IQ, it's EQ, it's our emotional intelligence, it's our LQ, our love quotient, how we love our communities, our societies, our colleagues, friends and family. So when we talk about overall human intelligence, emotional and in, uh, intelligence is key. So the path moving forward has to be behaved with trust. When we talk about, and, and uh, we talked about from the world economics point of view in terms of privacy and trust, this is key in terms of uh, establishing uh, relevance in a, in a post-digital economy. So it's not technology that's inherently good or bad, it's what we do with it. Again, this is the founder of Salesforce.com, Mark Benioff, and at World Economic Forum that earlier this year at Davos, he talked about ethical and humane use of technology, and it's our responsibility to ensure a proper use of powerful technologies like AI. So at my company, there are categories of research and I, I highly recommend any company that's committed to AI should have a research body so you can stay in, in, in touch with the latest uh, uh, achievements and, and work that's happening. We're focusing on vision, language, and voice wrapped around an ethical and humane use of technology framework. We believe computer vision is going to be used across all lines of business, all companies of all sizes. In fact, as machines are able to see and sense, you're gonna see a greater adoption of an environment with machines and humans creating value at the speed of need. We believe natural language processing is how we teach robots and machines to understand the human language. And there's multiple categories of science within NLP. I was really pleased to see that the startup uh, raise uh, included a focus on NLP. This is, uh, it will have profound impact in the service industry with use of chatbots and other technologies like virtual digital assistant. This will revolutionize the information technology space, in my opinion. We also believe that voice is the new user interface. We used to use command line and you used to point and click and drag. You know, anyone who has children or teenagers or younger, you realize the UI is now voice. And one in three homes in the US has smart speakers. So you're gonna be speaking to devices. When you're in your autonomous car, 
and you're safe, you're going to be speaking and conducting commerce and doing business. The relationship changes from driving the car, which is 100% of what we do today, to now you're an explorer, you're a traveler, you're a business person. And that's all done through voice as a user interface. But when we think about the framework in terms of ethical use at Salesforce, we think about responsibility. It's funny, when I put this slide, I thought, wow, it says rate. And it was very close to raise conference. In fact, if I change transparent to see-through, it would actually be raise. And this is our framework, but it's about responsibility. It's about accountability. It's about inclusiveness. Inclusiveness is important because algorithms are just our beliefs and, and, and ideas codified. So you have to have a diverse group of developers, diverse in gender, in ethnicity, in background, in order to make sure you're not introducing biases into your algorithms. So inclusiveness, transparency, and empowerment. This is the framework that we use at my company in terms of ethical use of technology. In fact, we have a chief ethical humane use officer at my company. I think every company needs to have a chief healthcare officer because every company is a health company now due to the pandemic. You need to have a chief ethical officer and we also have a chief equality officer to ensure inclusion at the highest level, including our most senior executive uh, uh, leaders at our business. Values create values. Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts becomes your words. Your words become your actions and habits and values ultimately your destiny. So when we talk about privacy and trust and ethical use of AI, your brand, your, your, your growth trajectory, your relevance to society is going to be predicated by your values. And at my company, you know, I'm proud to show this because we're one of the fastest growing software companies in the world. But what I'm most proud of is being known as a, you know, the best place to work and you know, the most giving back and most sustainable company. It, it, there's no, it, uh, doing well and doing good are not mutually exclusive. So values do create values. And it's not just the growth of my company, it's the impact that Salesforce has on the global economy. We're going to add millions of new jobs in the very near future. We're going to add almost $1.1 trillion to the, uh, to, to, to the global GDP. And I think about our impact of, of my company in India alone. Uh, we are going to create uh, you know, billions of dollars in incremental G GDP. We're going to create 1.3 million uh, new jobs indirectly with our customer e and partner ecosystem. But directly, we're going to add 548,000 new jobs in the near future. And in the next couple of years, we're committed to training 250,000 students. Education is the key to reduce this digital divide. According to the World Economic Forum, only 15% of companies, one five, 15% of companies are ready for the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is the blending of the physical world and the digital world using and leveraging combination of technologies like quantum computing, distributed ledgers and blockchain, immersive technologies like augmented and virtual reality, AI and machine learning and deep learning and computer visioning and smart robotics, Internet of Things, so, uh, 3D additive manufacturing. So when you think of these incredibly new emerging technologies, it's no longer about mobile, social, cloud and analytics. Those are table stakes. We've been talking about that for 10 years. It's these new emerging technologies that's going to separate companies in terms of their success in the fourth industrial revolution. But it starts with every company. Every company that participated in the Race 2020 should make a commitment to educating its stakeholders, employees, customers, uh, partners, and, and businesses. According to the World Economic Forum, individuals need 101 days of professional training from now until 2022 to be relevant in a post-digital economy. Think about that, 101 day of formal training. In 1998, the British rowing team was not successful in comp competitions. They would not rank in the top. And they were up, uh, concerned about the 2000 Sydney Olympics. So the captain of the team said they needed to change their habits and their behavior in order to show some success in the Sydney Olympics. So he asked the eight men to ask themselves every day this question, will it make the boat go faster? Does your diet, does your exercise, does the amount of sleep, who you, you know, socialize with, will it make the boat go faster? These eight men for two years governed everyday habits by asking this one question, will it make the boat go faster? And in the 2000 Sydney Olympics, they won gold. It's amazing how focus accelerates outcomes. We need to focus on understanding the impact of AI, but more importantly, the ethical use of AI, and even more importantly, why we do what we do. 
what are we going to do in agriculture and education and healthcare and every other industry? Because there is no sector that's going to be immune to AI. I started my title slide with the world of art, and now algorithms are creating beautiful art, uh, which, by the way, are selling for millions of dollars. So there's a great appreciation for digital algorithms creating art. So what's the question we should be asking uh, the 80,000 participants of the Race 2020 uh, uh, Summit? I would suggest maybe the question is, will it increase the value of flow? The next time you hire someone, the next time you choose a partner, the next time you invest in technology, ask yourself, is this going to increase the value of flow for my teachers in education, for my farmers in agriculture, for my doctors and nurses in healthcare? Ultimately, everything that we do should increase the value of flow. It is about movement. We walk together, we move together, we think together, we re resolve together, and together we take India and the globe forward. This is about a movement revolution and it will be powered by artificial intelligence. My name is Vala Afshar, I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Vala. That was amazing, that was breathtaking, but like, you covered so many aspects with regard to technology and with regard to what needs to be done. And all that I can say is that all the, the mantra that we need to do about our action plan and about what we do next is how do we reduce friction and optimize flow? How do we increase flow and ensure that things start moving the way we have? So thanks a lot for this brilliant presentation. In fact, we're getting lots of messages on our chats and all. This was truly uh, motivational. Thank you. Now I move on to our uh, Ajay Sani, our Secretary of Ministry of Electronics and IT, who is at the who is spearheading the Digital India Initiative of Government of India. He is one of the most accomplished civil servants who has contributed immensely to the field of IT, not only nationally but in his home state of Andhra Pradesh. And we look forward to his inspiration for this race summit, which has been done under his guidance and leadership. And also, most importantly, we did an AI solution challenge in which we have more than 300 entries, out of which. 21 best performing AI companies were chosen and I'm sure they would be listening to Mr. Wala's speech and thinking of how do we, how do they make the, take the most advantage of what is, what lies ahead and what lies in the years to come. So thank you and welcome to Shri Ajay Sani, sir. We look forward to hearing from you. Sir. Thank you, Abhishek and uh, uh, Excellency Dr. Uh, Isa Ali Ibrahim, uh, Honorable Federal Minister of uh, Communications and Digital Economy, Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, uh, CEO of Niti Ayog, and uh, a person who has the remarkable quality of always remaining positive no matter what. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. N. Chandrasekharan, uh, uh, Chairman Tata Sons, uh, uh, Mr. Bala Afshar, uh, Mr. Murat, uh, and Abhishek, uh, and friends and participants from across the globe who are uh, with this session. A very good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, depending on which part of the world you are participating from. Uh, wish you all a very good health, first of all, uh, in the age of uh, the pandemic. Uh, I hope uh, all of you continue to observe uh, uh, the appropriate behavior, COVID-19 appropriate behavior of uh, wearing uh, use of masks or face covers, especially when you are in public spaces, maintaining physical distance and uh, hand washing. I think we still have to not let down our guard, especially as we open up our economies. Uh, it's even more important to re-emphasize uh, these four messages uh, so that we help everyone recover uh, uh, rapidly and uh, you know, actually make the V-shaped recovery a, a reality. Uh, the RAISE 2020 conference uh, has been a tremendous revelation. I think it's not just uh, artificial intelligence whose time has come, but also uh, this conference uh, whose time had come. Uh, a conference uh, hosted by uh, India, organized by India, with global participation, with the, uh, you know, tremendous participation from uh, all over, whether it was experts, uh, uh, whether it was researchers, whether it was uh, uh, academicians, uh, practitioners, students, uh, you know, leaders of the industry uh, from across the globe, or the governments or the multilateral institutions. We got phenomenal response. And uh, 
imagine uh, an average of uh, uh, participation of about 2500 delegates or 2500 uh, people listening into all kinds of all these sessions more than around 45 sessions and you know tremendously consistent participation across across the all of it and i think it also emphasized uh, you know many of the sessions actually were uh, uh, did a lot of justice to the theme uh, to responsible ai how to make ai uh, you know emerge and uh, evolve in a very responsible manner how to especially you know something which india uh, really emphasizes a lot uh, our honorable prime minister as well as uh, my uh, our minister of uh, uh, electronics and it uh, both uh, seriously emphasize also uh, the importance of uh, making this this technology relevant uh, bringing the benefits of these technologies to every single human being whether it is in india or across on the earth i think this uh, conference has helped us uh, discuss many of those uh, issues has brought out uh, tremendous uh, uh, insights i would like to uh, you know especially mention even in this session and uh, the sessions that have uh, uh, you know we have had earlier um, you know professor raj reddy someone who is ex extraordinarily uh, you know a big uh, uh, presence in uh, artificial intelligence and his uh, emphasis on uh, overcoming the language barrier once and for all something that has been eluding us for forever and ever uh, making sure that every single person has access every single person has access to all the knowledge that the world is able to bring uh, to them and every single child gets uh, personalized learning and enablement uh, to help them uh, get ready for the use of uh, uh, use of what uh, uh, ai brings to them um, i would like to uh, you know mention murath has uh, uh, emphasized the importance of data and of having uh, you know uh, uh, creating the ecosystems that facilitate uh, uh, you know availability of data and the uh, you know how uh, data would actually get utilized uh, mr n chandra who has been an inspiration to all of us with his uh, digital nation and the uh, key strategies that he has uh, emphasized today and mr wala afshar who has actually uh, i will again repeat what uh, vishek said it was a breathtaking uh, expanse of uh, you know across uh, uh, so many areas and especially the movement and flow and creating the you know the bridge between uh, artificial and the human uh, uh, intelligence and uh, uh, you know so many things that uh, need to be done uh, absolutely breathtaking and fascinating insights so as we move forward i would like to emphasize that uh, you know artificial intelligence uh, is not uh, coming alone it is coming along with a full spectrum of very very important technologies each one of these technologies has the has this has the possibility of causing disruption taken together i think it's the the opportunities are absolutely i we we probably cannot imagine today what kind of uh, combinations will emerge uh, whether it is uh, you know the big compute and store uh, the cloud uh, massive availability of cloud based services the big data not just big data but also diverse data where india can contribute tremendously uh, of advanced analytics of 5g and iot which uh, you know together i think they are made for each other and as those get rolled out the amount of data that would come in uh, also increases exponentially the Uh, ar and vr technologies the drones and robotics the additive manufacturing technologies the blockchain technology and so many advances that are also happening simultaneously in uh, in uh, life sciences which all will come together it's not just communications it's not just uh, uh, you know a one one area ai comes along with all these and i think it's not really 
really good to distinguish or to think of AI as a separate uh, uh, entity that is uh, coming in. So we must look at all of this coming in together and how do we prepare for this? I would like to especially uh, mention how we see this uh, from India and where uh, uh, we uh, assess uh, uh, India to be and what kind of readiness uh, we are uh, trying to enhance. Uh, you know, India has a combination of uh, tremendous strength in uh, uh, in IT. Some of the IT services giants from of the world are Indian companies. R and D of all the technology, major technology companies from across the globe, a significant part of that R and D today happens in India. The new products, new services actually get designed in India for the globe. And they are, it, the Indian uh, engineers and designers contribute tremendously to these. We have tremendous momentum in electronic manufacturing as well. So it's, it's actually creating the base for devices and solutions to, uh, to happen. Uh, we have extensive uh, coverage of uh, 4G and uh, soon I hope uh, 5G will join that, which brings uh, data huge data at extraordinarily low tariff to a large part of India. And soon, I think we'll be moving towards almost complete universal coverage here. The availability of structured data in every domain, you know, the national public digital platforms are helping us stitch it all together. We have huge data that is flowing in projects that have been implemented. As we look at the Nationwide, uh, nationwide, uh, uh, you know, data platforms in every domain. These help us to organize our data. These help us to clean up our data. <clears throat> These help us to structure, build, inbuilt privacy, inbuilt security, inbuilt the legal requirements, and then make this data available in a manner that inspires trust and confidence. Tremendous amount of trust and confidence. I think trust and confidence is going to be extraordinarily important as we move forward. And we are using this mechanism of the national public data uh, platforms to actually build across every domain nationwide platforms that will help us create uh, India health stack and India uh, finance stack and India education stack and India logistics stack and so on and so forth. On top of which, we would be creating structured opportunities for everyone, whether it is startups, whether it is uh, companies, big or small, to actually build value on top of these value-added products, value-added services, do tremendous amount of data analytics and create completely new products and services. Joining these is a wonderful legal framework that is quickly coming in place, uh, which uh, uh, you know, some of that is uh, before our parliament today and uh, uh, soon, I think in, in the next uh, few months, we should see this uh, emerge as a robust uh, uh, legal framework uh, enabling all of this. A lot of unicorns and sunicorns. You know, we were blown away with the kind of uh, response we got to our, uh, uh, our startup, uh, uh, startup uh, uh, challenge round uh, for AI. Uh, 21 and that we had to actually stop ourselves. We had announced that we will select 15 because we said it's a global conference. So will, we, will we get 15 which are, uh, you know, ready to be showcased here? We actually, it was extremely difficult for us to stop at 21. These are mushrooming and they are mushrooming not only in the big centers of technology in India. They are coming now even from small uh, cities and towns and uh, you know everywhere where higher education has gone where technology has gone uh, we are seeing this uh, mushroom and one of the reasons that I uh, see for this uh, you know so much of a groundswell of innovation so much of a groundswell of uh, startups is the availability of unsolved problems the to really come up with path breaking innovation, we must have two things. The ability to solve problems, 
along with problems to solve. There are many parts of the world, many parts of the globe, which have a wonderful ability to solve problems. They are running out of problems to solve. There are other parts of the world which have plenty of problems to solve, but not the commensurate ability to solve the problem. India has both, both a huge ability to solve problems and a significant number of problems to be solved. I think this is where the rubber meets the road and we are preparing to do everything we can to ensure that it starts happening here in significant numbers. A national program on AI is taking shape. We are fine tuning that with the help of huge number of inputs that we have received during this global conference. And soon we should see it becoming, uh, getting unveiled. And uh, with that, I would once again like to thank uh, Abhishek and uh, uh, you know, all of you uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present my thoughts before you. Uh, thank you and uh, back to you, Abhishek. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir, for your uh, overall remarks and laying down the overall IT framework and the vision that we have for enabling the growth of startups and the IT companies in India. Thanks a lot. With this, we come to this in a global summit has really been, has seen participation from multiple countries across the world. And one of the key partners that we have is Nigeria, who had several speakers in several panels. And Nigeria, as we know, is the largest economy in Africa with $400 billion GDP, the largest country as per population in Africa, 200 million people. And it has similar objectives for AI that we have. We share the AI for all strategy. And we have amongst us today, Honorable Minister for uh, Communications and Digital Economy, and also the Chairman of the Broadband Foundation of Nigeria, Dr. Isa Ali Ibrahim Pantami, who is who has studied computer science from Abu Bakr Tafwa Balewa University in Nigeria. He is a PhD from Robert Gordon University, Abbott in Scotland. He is trained in digital transformation at Harvard University, USA, and management strategy at MIT. He has been uh, he has authored a, a dozen books on ICT, STEM, technology, politics, and communi community reconciliation, religion, and peaceful e coexistence. He has been leading the efforts with regard to using AI for social transformation in Nigeria. It's our proud privilege to welcome amongst us His Excellency, Dr. Isa Ali Abraham Pantami, Honorable Federal Minister of Communications and Digital Economy to this closing session of RACE 2020. Welcome, sir. Sir, you have to unmute yourself. You, you are on mute, sir. Okay, it's okay. Uh, the representative of uh, the Minister of uh, Electronics and IT Government of India, being represented by the Secretary Ajay Shawne, the Indian High Commissioner here in Nigeria, Abhe Sakur. The keynote speaker of uh, today, Vala Afshar, all other CEOs here present, good afternoon to all of you, good morning to some of you, good evening to some of you, it all depends on where you are. I'm highly excited to be part of a RAISE 2020 program organized by the government of India. And uh, this is a highly commendable program discussing about responsible artificial intelligence for social empowerment. This uh, summit came up at the right time that uh, we must be proactive when it comes to emerging technologies. The countries that are proactive will be in the forefront in the next few years. When a country fails to be proactive in digital technology or innovation, they will waste their time trying to only imitate others and emulate them as the case may be. So that is why we had been agitating for being proactive 
partaking in critical thinking, long-term thinking, analytical thinking, partake in creativity, and uh, many more. In Nigeria here, being the largest economy in Africa, and uh, also the country with the largest population, which is roughly around 200 million people, uh, most probably less than 30% uh, of your population in India. But in Africa here, we are leading when it comes to population and uh, many more. And if you look at our geographic location, you will discover that Nigeria is somehow at the center of Africa. There is a proximity to South Africa, West African countries, East African countries, North African countries, and many more. You will see strategically when you are in Nigeria, you are at the gateway of uh, the remaining West African countries, at the gateway of East African countries, at I think there is some uh, problem in connectivity at uh, in Nigeria. We are just waiting for the honorable minister to connect. They are just reconnecting. Yeah, I think he's back. Welcome back, sir. I think there was some disruption. You are mute, sir. Can you unmute yourself? And Can you unmute yourself, sir? Sir, you are mute. Right, tell him. Right. Tell him. Yes, sir. Right. We, can, we can move on. Okay. So, till we uh, wait for uh, Honorable Minister to log in back, I think he's logged in back. So, some technical glitch. Can you unmute yourself, please? We have been experiencing challenges. I don't know what actually happens. And I hope my time is not off. No, no, please carry on. <laughs> so, so, so thank you very much. Briefly in Nigeria here, I will only share our experience with you and uh, what we have been doing and what we plan to do in the future. Uh, initially, I was a chief executive of uh, the National Information Technology Development Agency, which is the the regulator and the developer of IT in the country. On 21st November, 21st August 2019, just last year, the president of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, has elevated me to be a minister of a federal ministry of our communications then. Immediately, I reviewed the mandate of the ministry and I discovered that the mandate was really obsolete. And I came up with new strategies and policies. Part of that, I submitted to Mr. President requesting 
to focus more on digital economy. And the president has approved that and the ministry has been renamed from Federal Ministry of our Communications to Federal Ministry of our Communications and Digital Economy. We immediately developed national digital economy policy for a digital Nigeria. In that policy, there are eight pillars. Number one is developmental regulation. Number two is digital skills. Number three is solid infrastructure. Number four is service infrastructure. Number five is digital services. Number six is digital society uh, soft infrastructure. Number seven is digital society and emerging technologies. Number eight is indigenous content development and promotion. If you look at the pillars, you'll discover number seven is on emerging technologies. So artificial intelligence is part and parcel of uh, emerging technologies or disruptive technologies. We started implementing the policy immediately. And uh, the policy was launched and unveiled by the president on 28 November 2019. And uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we had been compelled to fast track the implementation. Within that period of time, we are able to digitalize many government processes and activities in the country. And uh, we also developed our national broadband plan in order to ensure the, we increase broadband penetration in Nigeria. Before I was appointed as the minister, the broadband penetration in the country, starting from 2000 to 2019, you'll discover. I think there's another disruption in connectivity. Abhishek, we should move on. Okay, so in view of the technical glitches, we we move on to the. Now we have next we have uh, Sri Amitabh Kant, CEO of the National Institution for Transforming India, Niti Aayog, who is giving us the uh, address to us. He is the author of Branding India, an incredible story, and throughout his career, he has been the key driver of several initiatives like the Make in India, the Startup India, Incredible India, and God's Own Country initiatives. And he has been leading the initiatives for ensuring that technology becomes a key driver for India's transformation and India's growth. Sir, we welcome you to this summit and we thank you also for the support that we have got from you with regard to planning this summit and ensuring that we do it at a world, level, world class level. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the RACE 2020 Global Virtual Summit has been a resounding success. It's been an exceptional event. And uh, after this very visionary presentation by Mr. Chandrasekhar, uh, the tremendous insight on data that Murad presented, and a truly phenomenal and an awesome presentation by Vala, who packed in so much, I want to be extremely brief. Uh, what is amazing is that this virtual format has allowed this summit to have a record number of participants. More than about 80,000 people have registered from over 147 different countries. And with such great participation from across the world, RAISE 2020 truly became a global platform for the exchange of ideas and thoughts for creating a robust artificial intelligence roadmap for the world. Uh, uh, the vast number of sessions which have totaled over about 100 hours of rich content, captured the insights of the global thought leaders and the leading minds in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, we've covered a range of uh, areas from health tech, ed tech, natural language processing, smart mobility, transportation, agriculture, and its huge implication uh, for the vast segment of the population and particularly the poor and the needy. India was one of the first countries to explicitly take up the positioning in the national strategy for artificial intelligence that AI needs to be leveraged for everyone. AI for all was our motto and the use of AI needed to be prioritized for enabling social impact and empowerment. RACE 2020 has taken us very close to that ground with great vision. 
and the summit has brought together global experts to create a roadmap for responsible AI and an action plan that can help create replicable models with a strong foundation of ethics built in. Ladies and gentlemen, as was said by Mr. Chandrasekhar, data lies at the core of development of AI technologies. India's digital footprint is its biggest strength for AI development. Uh, we have a huge amount of data, a humongous amount of data at the cheapest possible cost, cost in the world. And we have a, over a billion smartphones today. India today performs 22 cashless transactions per person, and it is uh, its huge amount of uh, smartphone penetration has grown over fivefold. And in in the last three years, India's digitization effort uh, through platforms such as Aadhaar, the Unified Payment Interface, the Goods and Services Tax, the Public Finance Management System, and the digital infrastructure that has been created has created a unique opportunity for artificial intelligence to be leveraged to increase transparency and improve governance. We also have a huge diversity. Uh, we are home to over 2000 ethnic groups with 22 different scheduled languages, 122 major languages and about 1600 languages spoken in India. And huge geographical and cultural diversity as well. And we are one country which has huge developmental challenges in areas of agriculture, healthcare, education, infrastructure, and transportation. And these challenges are representative of similar ones faced by other countries. And actually when India solves using artificial intelligence for the people of India, it's not solving for the 1.4 billion people of India, but for the next 7 billion people of the world who are moving from poverty to middle class. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the challenge really is to use artificial intelligence to transform the lives of the people of India and the world. As the Honorable Prime Minister said, India's approach to the roadmap for artificial intelligence is powered by the core principles of teamwork, trust, collaboration, responsibility, and inclusivity. India's national program on AI will be dedicated towards the rightful use of AI in solving societal problems. And therefore, we will ramp up our computing facilities. We will take the quantum computing a big leap forward, and we will, in a very big way, skill our people, our engineers from IIT, triple IITs, NITs, and many of our academic institutions for the artificial intelligence world of tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. We are still in the artificial intelligence spring in the world. We are still at its beginning era. And RACE 2020 has cemented India's position in the AI world. The summit has proven that as India extends a hand, the rest of the world is not hesitant to reach out for it. Together, AI for social empowerment can define a new era of cooperation and prosperity, taking human civilization to the next level of progress. Ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Chandrasekhar. I take this opportunity to thank uh, Murad. And I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Wala for his very, very powerful keynote address. And I take this opportunity to thank the Honorable Minister from Nigeria, um, His Excellency Dr. Isa Al Pantami. And I also take this opportunity to congratulate our entire team led by Abhishek and a whole lot of youngsters who work behind this team to make this, uh, make this unique conference a resounding success story. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. And uh, with this, we come to the close of the uh, closing session. And uh, I would take this opportunity to thank you, sir, for giving us the support and direction for doing this event. And I would also like to thank all our partners, all our supporters who, who helped us with curating this content. The team at my Metis, NEGD, the team at NITI, the team at DIC, MyGov, the team uh, supported the support that we got from the U Chicago team of the Rockefeller Foundation, the support that we got from uh, NASCOM, 
Fiki, the companies like IBM, Google, uh, Microsoft, Intel, UN Women, uh, who helped us curate the sessions. I would also like to thank government of Telangana, government of Tamil Nadu, government of Karnataka, who did the state showcases. And I would also like to thank all the speakers who joined from across the world to, uh, to, uh, for this session. One more important thing I would like to mention. So we had all the sessions with at least one or two women members. And we also had one session which, had, which was curated by women, which had all women members talking on AI and impact of technology for inclusion. And we look forward to uh, working with, uh, with all the participants and the, those who had registered. We thank everyone who joined the sessions, gave us the valuable feedback through our uh, chats, through our questions and answers. And the, 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 this, this, this communication will continue, this conversation will continue, and we'll have to work together to act on the roadmap that is laid down for the responsible AI for social empowerment. So I once again thank all the speakers in the, in the closing plenary, and I also thank the vision and leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister and our Minister for Electronics and IT for giving us all the support for ensuring that we could do such an event at such a short notice on, on this platform. And last but not the least, I would not like to also mention the company who provided us the VC platform. It's a small startup based in Ahmedabad, Hubilo, whose kids, whose uh, CEO, Mr. Rohan, and the entire team work day in and day out to make this event very successful. So I conclude this session by conveying my thanks to the entire team behind RAISE 2020, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you, everyone.